Um, so our last speaker of the section, uh, Bill Freeman, Professor of Electrical Engineering and Computer Science. Um, in addition to having actually been on my committee when I was a doctoral student, um, if you do any work in uh, computer vision, um, you either have to cite Bill or you cite a paper once removed. So his, uh, his work has received a number of awards as sort of the test of time. Uh, so he'll be telling us about some of his recent work in visualizing motion uh, and some interesting sensing systems enabled by it. Great, thanks. Oh, thank you. Thanks a lot. Okay, um, can everyone hear me? Good. Okay, so I'm an outlier in this session. I don't do chemistry at all. Uh, I do computation. And let me just go on record and say I'd be delighted if this joint session led to a collaboration with any of the previous speakers. That'd be great. Um, so um, we've made a, a new kind of microscope. Uh, I should say off the bat before I get into it, uh, this is joint work uh, kind of over a long period of time with uh, Professor Fredo Durand and also with uh, two of my students, uh, Mickey Rubenstein and Neil Wadwa. Um, so we've made a new kind of microscope. It's a computational microscope. So let's take a look on the left. First of all, we have a sleeping baby. And, um, and uh, if, if you've been a parent of a newborn baby, you might know this impulse to look and check whether the baby's breathing. And, and you don't always see it if you look. I mean, it's, it's not obvious. Um, so here's the video of the baby. And, and it's really hard to tell if the baby's breathing. So uh, you could, um, what's a motion microscope? Well, a, an ordinary microscope, like a size microscope, takes a picture and makes it look bigger. A motion microscope takes in a video and gives you a new video out where the motions have been made bigger. And so here's the output of the motion microscope applied to this input video. And you can see that the motions have been made bigger. And you know, yes, you can check that the, the baby is indeed breathing. Um, and, but you can apply this to, to, to image sequences of all types. So uh, here's uh, looking at a crane. Again, the input is on the left. And when you know that the thing sways, you know that it flexes. Uh, we study that in engineering school. But now you can actually see it, uh, this visualization of the, the motions of the crane. So first I want to tell you how this works, because it's so simple I can explain it in a sh short amount of time. And, and then I want to just go through a list of, of videos of applying this to different applications in the world. So, uh, OK. This is a check for an MIT audience. How many of you are familiar with the Fourier transform? OK, great, great, good. <laughs> um, so. So you, with that familiarity, you might think that the first, you know, the first thing that might come to mind for how to make a motion microscope, you take your video, you take a Fourier transform of it, and, and you know, motion corresponds to phase change of a sinusoid. It goes from you know, cosine to cosine, a little bit towards sine, and, and so forth. And so you could, if you just take a Fourier transform and measure the phase of, phases of all the sinusoids, you'll, you'll be able to, to detect a small motion because those phases will change. OK, sounds like a great idea, but it's got this, this uh, fatal flaw, which is at the bottom of the screen here. Uh, the, the Fourier transform is a global transform. So if you actually did that, this, this, that technique would only work to measure and amplify motion for, um, for, for motions that were uniform over the whole image. And I should say the way you would do that if, that, if you did have a motion of that type, you could go take your image frame by frame, calculate the Fourier transform. Um, measure for phase changes over time as the video played. And if you wanted to amplify it, then you could go and amplify that phase change. So you replace every sinusoid with a new sinusoid where the phase was advanced artificially by an extra amount, and then inverse transform and go back to the a video sequence. And again, that's only going to work if you have a special case where there's only one motion in the image. So can we tweak it to make it work for more general videos? Well, you can. And instead of a, a, a sinusoid, we're going to use a little sinusoidal wavelet one that's spatially localized. And so it's got its uh, little, so there's a sinusoid modulating under this little Gaussian envelope. And you can just do the same trick that I just described, but now locally under this little wavelet envelope. And so you can, um, if, so, so you could look at the response of a little wavelet. You could measure its change in phase. You could then amplify the change in phase and transform back to an image. So to do that, you need a, um, uh, an image transform that takes an image and breaks it into all these little localized wavelets. So here's some of those wavelets, sine and cosine phase. 
And it turns out we have one. I actually worked on it for my thesis. <laughs> it's it's kind of cool to use it again now. Um, and so you uh, so here's the the processing. Take each video frame by frame. You break it into this this transform representation of each frame of the image, where you can um, have for every position, orientation, and scale, you have a sine and cosine wavelet. And then over time, you can watch how those phases change just a little bit as your, the thing you're looking at moves just a little bit. And then you can go amplify those phase changes. And then you transform back to the image domain, and you get your output video. OK. So that works. Um, I, I, I always, anyway, it just bothers me how people seem to find a need to put lights on a projected screen. It just doesn't work. But anyway, this is low <laughs> contrast. I'm, I'm sorry. Uh, it, just one more thing before we go into showing you examples. You all should be asking, yeah, but OK, are those exaggerated motions, are they veridical? So we also sought to check that out. And, and how would you check what a veridical motion magnified sequence is? Well, we, uh, we took a sequence. We have this beam structure. And we're going to hit it with a hammer. And we have an accelerometer on there. We assert that the motion magnified sequence you want is if you have a pair of hits with the hammer, one really light tap and one huge tap, uh, you can look at the ratio of the motions with the accelerometer. And you want to be able to start from the one with the tiny tap and computationally amplify it to look just like the one where it was hit really hard. That's a, a successful motion magnification is if those two things look the same. So we actually did that. And again, we is uh, someone else. It's Justin Chen, who um, was at the time a graduate student in civil engineering, collaborating with us on this. So um, well, just to, I just want to make the point that it does work. Um, here's the video. Here's one line of it. We're, we're amplifying that one line uh, here. And then time is vertical. So this little picture of that line intensities over time shows you the input video. And it's pretty boring. It's just straight lines as a function of time. You can't really see much change. Now, if you whack it 50 times harder, <laughs> you get this. It bounces back and forth. You see those wiggles there. And if you take this one and computationally motion magnify it, you get this uh, slice of a motion sequence. And you can see that it's, it's really quite similar. And, and the, the um, video magnified and the accelerometer uh, motions are, sorry, the video measurements and the accelerometer measurements are quite similar. You can see from these overlapping traces. So, and again, I apologize for the lighting. But um, uh, here's the input video. Here's computationally motion magnified by a factor of 50. Here's grabbing some time when we hit it 50 times harder with a hammer. And they look quite similar. OK, so now let's just go out in the world and explore what it looks like with seen through a motion microscope. Um, we think there are kind of three dominant classes of applications, at least so far. I'd love to find new classes, so please speak up if you have things in mind. Physics, engineering, and people. All right. Here's a high-speed video of a little hammer hitting a PVC pipe viewed end on. Again, pretty boring in the raw video. But we know from the math uh, that this thing, when you hit it with a hammer, it rings like a bell. And you've got all these normal modes, and they're oscillating each at their own special frequency, uh, special temporal frequency. So let's take this input video and motion magnify it each at, at, at these three different frequencies, amplifying whatever you see at those frequencies of oscillation. And wow, now you, see the, you can see the, the normal mode oscillation of that pipe, which you couldn't see before. So this is useful, I think, for, for education. And also. <laughs> Also, I'm told that if the pipe is damaged, the normal modes change in both their shape and their temporal frequency. So this would be a way to, to uh, perhaps useful for non-destructive testing. Um, so, so now, you know, I just this is really one of my favorite uh, research projects. I get to go into look and look around the world and see where might there be tiny motions where you could amplify them and see something interesting. So, so the next I'm just going to show you a whole lot of things in that form. So I was a physics undergraduate, and I told us in physics undergrad that um, the transitions of turbulence involved in small oscillations that become bigger and bigger. So, so here's incense in my house. And uh, my mechanical engineering friends tell me that there are streamwise instabilities called pullman schlippmann waves, which uh, occur in the laminar flow region and become larger and larger and get turbulence. 
And so let's motion magnify that video on the left. And here's the resulting video. It's a little bit hard to see from the video because everything's moving too quickly. So let's look at a single frame. And here's a frame of the input video and a frame of the motion magnified video. And so now you can see those small instabilities that get larger and larger as it moves toward the region of instability, of turbulence. Um, engineering. Okay. Here's the pole balancing problem. How many of you know what the pole balancing problem is? It's a sort of classic control problem that roboticists use to see how well they can design their controllers. You're, you try to balance a pole upside down like this. Your, your robot tries to. Here they're making it really hard. Here's the, that's the controller. There's the pole. There's another pole. There's a joint here and another one. So that's like a double jointed pole balancing problem. Not easy, but, but uh, Russ Tedrick's group has made a pole balancer. And uh, his grad students collaborated with us, and they took high-speed video of the pole balancing system and the pole balancing system with the bolts loosened, maliciously loosened, five minutes. Okay, so here first is the raw high-speed videos comparing the two conditions. And, you know, the, the, the details of where the pole is are different, but otherwise you really can't tell a difference in the character of the motion. But now let's take those two sequences and motion magnify each of them and see if we can see any difference in the two states. So here's motion magnified, same sequence as, as before. Now you can see that the one on the right where the bolts have been maliciously loosened, it's struggling to control this thing because the system isn't behaving the way it's expect, it had expected it would behave. And so it's, it's struggling to, to make the thing work. So this is, uh, so um, I like to say that uh, Catastrophic big motions often start out with tiny motions. And so here's a system that lets you measure tiny motions, and hopefully you can identify those problems before they can become big catastrophic motions. Um, I think I'll skip this one for time, but uh, NASA asked, asked us to look at the, uh, this uh, solar arm on the International Space Station when they boosted it so we could see some motions there. Sorry, let me go to this one. Here's a bridge. Uh, it's a drawbridge uh, off scene. Not, it's the uh, Portsmouth World War I Memorial Bridge, New Hampshire. There's a uh, drawbridge that closes off on the right. And it, um, here's the just video playing. Can't see much interesting going on, but if we motion and magnify it, um, we're, we're doing it at a particular frequency of one of the torsional modes. And you can see that this, this bridge is, is uh, motion, moving in response to the drawbridge off to the right lowering down. Um, and people, okay, here's my daughter. Uh, I asked her just to stay still. That's the input video. Now we're going to amplify different temporal frequencies in a person staying still to see what we can see. Here's the low temporal frequencies, uh, 0.1 to 0.5 hertz. So what do you see a person, uh, in a person when you amplify those frequencies? Well, I primarily see them breathing. Uh, here's a little bit higher frequencies, one to two hertz, and you can see these little micro expressions in her face. People ask us, ah, you can read her mind now. And well, we don't know if that's true. We haven't explored it. <laughs> and uh, the high frequencies, two and a half to four and a half hertz, uh, you primarily see uh, eye saccades, um, a little bit of noise amplified in the background. Oh, yeah, a ballet dancer. Okay, this, this, and when I play it, this will be the input, the, what you really see, which is effortless, perfectly standing on one foot, and then on the right is going to be what really goes on behind the scenes to get a person to be able to balance on one foot. You can see it's, there's a lot of control going on to keep you from falling over when you're standing on one foot, even a, someone as well-trained as a ballet dancer. Um, this won't show up, but these are isocods. OK, boy, this one's really great. Um, sorry for the contrast, but I'll play it anyway. OK, here's uh, Mickey. He's going to sing for us. The sound doesn't work. I'll, I'll sing what he sang. Uh... Here's a spectrum of what's recorded from a microphone. Here's a high-speed video of his throat singing that. Not too interesting, but let's motion magnify the, the bass frequency. And again, I apologize for the lights shining on the projector, uh, projected screen. But uh, here, if you want to come up later, I'll show you. Uh, here's the, the motions of his throat that, co that correspond with the sound at that frequency. Um, so I'll skip this one also. 
Uh, we can also amplify small color changes. This is not done in the way I described before. I don't have time to describe it, but I can just show you the result. We can look at someone and reveal their, so all of you are glowing like little light bulbs now as the pulse goes to your skin, uh, oxygen, oxygenated blood, and we can uh, amplify that and let you see it. And possibly asymmetries in this would be useful in um, non-contact diagnosis. We can also uh, have a non-contact measuring of infant's pulse, which is uh, useful in some cases. And, and then, you know, the web is this wonderful place. We post our code online and people post us videos of them processing with our system. So here's uh, a pregnant belly <laughs> motion magnified. Uh, and my wife tells me that's what it feels like. Yeah. <laughs> um, so we, we've done collaboration with uh, Denny Freeman, uh, who looks at acoustic waves propagating across uh, tectoral membranes in the ear. And here's the motion magnified. Um, it's an interesting question. Um, the, the, the visualization is quite useful. They can tell whether their system's broken or not. They, they publish the measurements they make, but then they show videos like this to audiences to let people understand what the measurements signify. Um, there. So um, I'm interested in, in many different application areas. One is medical. So uh, the, the canonical picture of a doctor is somebody with uh, this stethoscope, which is a motion magnification device around their neck. And if that's so useful for a diagnostic, then possibly this video motion magnification might also be useful for internal uh, imaging uh, of the body. I'm interested in to explore that. So um, we have lots of articles and uh, videos on our web pages. You're welcome to look. Thanks very much.